Hey everybody, welcome back to another edition of the His and Her Money Show, where we are dedicated to helping you take dominion over your money and your life. Thank you so much for tuning in to another fantastic episode. There's plenty of other shows you could be listening to or watching, but we're glad that you are here with us. Do us a favor, if you hear anything that resonates with you that you feel other people might benefit from, go ahead and share it on your socials. Make sure you tag us at His and Her Money whether you put it on your Facebook page or your IG stories, our handle is the same. We want to show you love back. So make sure you tag us when you share. You are going to love today's episode because, hey, we're still at the top of this year and we still have time to make some strides to get on track financially. We hope that you came into this year with some goals or aspirations to get your money in order. But if you haven't, if you're in a place where you're trying to figure that out right now, well, this episode is going to help you tremendously. We got two of our old buddies coming by because they have collaborated to write a fantastic new book called Stacked. And it's going to help you on your journey to managing your money and being more efficient with every dollar that you earn. We're going to be talking with Joe Saul Sihai and Emily Guy Birkin, and they're going to share all of their wisdom with all of us on today's episode. So let's not delay this any further. Let's get Joe and Emily on so we can hear all of their fantastic wisdom. Hey, Joe. Hey, Emily. Welcome back to the His and Her Money Show. I'm so happy to be here, man. Thank you so much. Thank you for having us. We're glad to have you. We have had both of you individually on past episodes of the His and Her Money Show, but we've never had you guys combining forces like you are today. Coming together like Voltron, you all have written a brand new book that's really dope, man. There's a lot of there's a lot of money books in the atmosphere, but um, you all, your personalities come through in the pages of the book. Um, you all are super practical in the book, and you all are balanced in your approach to even the, the the tips and advice that you share. You give pros and cons in your book. But before we talk about the book, let's talk about y'all because people may have not caught those episodes where you all were previously a guest. So for those being introduced to you for the very first time. Can you say hello to them and let them know what you're all about? Uh, I'm Emily Guy Birkin. Um, I'm a freelance writer and author. Um, Stacked is actually my fifth book um, on personal finance. Um, I've also, uh, my first book was um, um, Five Years Before You Retire. And my most recent prior to this one was End Financial Stress Now. Um, I'm actually an English teacher by training. I um, taught high school English for four years. Um, and then my husband and I moved and I had a very ill-timed baby. Um, he was uh, he was due at the beginning of, uh, of the next school year. And so because of that, I took a year off. Um, and to keep a little bit of money coming in, my goal was just to uh, keep paying my student loans. I took a couple of writing gigs and one of the first ones was for a financial um, blog. Uh, the editor loved my work, passed my name along to his friends, invited me to FinCon for the first time, um, the 2011 FinCon. And uh, suddenly it's 11 years later and I have a completely different career than the one I trained for. Um, and I, I really love it. It's I get to do all the things I really liked about teaching. I, I love writing about um, money and uh, researching money and thinking deeply about these things. And it's just a, a passion career that I never expected. And I'm Joe Saul Sihai. I'm the host of the Stacking Benjamins podcast. But way before that, you and I have something in common, which is that uh, I was early on a uh, money mess up. I was messing up everything. I destroyed my credit. I was horrible. And then I not only turned it around, I became a financial planner. I was a financial planner for 16 years. And I had this mentor who said, who sent out a letter one day saying that he liked being a financial planner. He didn't love it. And he had to really do what he valued. And he didn't know because he was working so many hours doing this other job. And uh, he said he had other mountains to climb was the exact quote. And that really resonated with me because I was turning 40. And I said, you know what? I really like being a financial planner. I don't love it. And I think I want to be a high school teacher and I want to be a track coach. And so I, I sold my business 
And uh, and it's funny because while he was actually th there was no hyperbole in him saying I have other mountains to climb, he actually went on and climbed Mount Everest and almost all of the biggest mountains in the world. Like he and now he runs an adventure travel company and did something different. I went to school to become a high school teacher. And while I love teachers, all the teachers that were clients of mine kept telling me that it was going to be frustrating, that I was going to be fighting. I was going to be fighting administration. I was going to really struggle. And uh, I, I made it two, I made it two semesters in the teaching program before I realized that it was going to be, it was going to be much more fun teaching money. So I started writing money articles that became a blog. The blog became the podcast podcast now just a few weeks ago um, uh, uh, had its 10th anniversary, 10 years old, our little baby is. So yeah, so that's, wow. that's me. Super dope, super dope. But you all have combined forces to write a dope book called Stacked. Let's talk about the subtitle though, The Super Serious Guide to Modern Money Management. Now me knowing y'all like I do, I'm I'm curious about the super serious part. I know it's there for a reason. I know the two authors. So I want to let y'all unpack. Why is this the super serious guide to modern, not ancient, but modern money management? Break all this down, please. So um I I feel like what, what happened was our um our publisher wanted a, a subtitle. And they had, I had originally said something like your funny guide to modern money management. And Joe and I both feel like, and I, I, yeah, we revolted on that one. Yeah. We're like, if you have to say that it's funny, then it's not, you know? <laughs> um, and so, um, we kind of, we wanted to go in the opposite direction and say, like, if we say that it's super serious, then you know that it's not, you know, like you can hear kind of the, uh, the scare quotes around it when like the super serious. <laughs> guide. <laughs> um, and so that was, uh, that was something where we, we really wanted to make it clear just from the, from the title and already the, uh, the title stacked, uh, that was, um, our agent's suggestion. Um, and we really loved that. We loved that, that, the, um, the suggestion, it, she got our tone exactly right. My favorite moment when it came to the title was, uh, I was asking my sister for some help with something on my, my, my website. She's really good at design and that sort of thing. And so including the title as we're, we're gearing up for the launch. And so my sister says to me, as we're doing this, she's like, you know, that stacked also means big boobs, right? <laughs> I was like, yeah, that that's yeah. <laughs> it's all in there. Okay, got it. <laughs> it's all in there. <laughs> but th there is there is a serious reason why we wanted to lighten the mood because like you, you know, I've interviewed lots and lots of people in the in the money space and is in and and I think an area where where you and I cross paths a lot is that you know because you work with so many people that are new to the money game that that we got to lighten it up because if money is so serious that if we, that it drives people away, it makes people not plan more people plan a vacation than plan their retirement. People spend way more time planning what they're going to do next weekend than planning these little money moves. And yet we think about like exercise as an example, exercise, you got to keep exercising all the time to see results and as we all know, if you just spend 30 minutes one time working on your money, you will have lasting results for a long period of time. So it's not about building a muscle in the same way that a good diet does or healthcare does. We just want people to do one thing at first, take that first step. There was a study out there called uh, by a group called Nonfiction, which I absolutely love. It's called The Secret Financial Lives of Americans. And it talks about how 150 million people in the United States report that they've cried about their money. They've cried. And you'd think that that's just people who are living paycheck to paycheck like I was early on, really struggling with money. And I remember crying when I ran out of gas one day. I had no idea how I was going to get home because I had no credit. I borrowed the max money I could borrow from family. I, I was screwed. I had no resources. But it wasn't just that. 
of people making over $250,000 a year, nearly half of those people report that they cry about their money. So I think it's, it's the response of, on one hand, you feel, you feel like I, if I had more money and I had some way to get to my next paycheck, I can make this work. But for people that have money and have means, I think they're crying about the fact that their money isn't matching their values and they don't have those in alignment. So we thought that the best way to achieve our mission, which was to, to kind of spread the good word of, of solid, sound financial management, was to lighten the mood as much as we possibly could. Yeah, and you did well. So let's talk about this because it's a super serious guy, but this is a super serious topic um, because as you alluded to, even from that research, our feelings, how we feel going into each and every day can be correlated to our financial situation. When we feel comfortable with the amount of money in our bank accounts, we, we move and operate differently. When we feel as though we are cutting things close financially, it's stressful all day. You're you're constantly keeping your eye on where you're where what you're about to buy. Can I buy this? Can I afford that? Is my car going to be overcharged? So it's important that we take this serious. So as we people listening are trying to delve to get their money managed better, one of the first things that you all talk about in the book is the importance of setting goals, which to some, maybe something that they've heard before, but as you all talk about, you know, just because you've heard a goal or attempted to go doesn't mean that you are doing it correctly. And it's important that you do certain things with your goals in order to make them higher or a higher likelihood of actually accomplishing those goals. So can you guys kind of break down why this is something we should do up front? And some of the things we should keep in mind while we try to do this step. Yeah, Joe actually introduced me to the idea of what he calls timelining your goals. Um, I am a great goal setter. I have like my whole life, I've got, you know, uh, journals from, you know, childhood, like my goal this year is to do this. But that would be all I did with it. So as a freelancer, um, every year I'd set myself an income goal and uh, that would look real pretty in my journal. And then in November, I'd be like, yeah, I'm not going to meet it because I hadn't done anything to kind of give myself a timeline for meeting those goals. <clears throat> Excuse me. So Joe has uh, created this idea of um, putting your goals on a timeline so that you can see how they interact with each other and you can get a sense of like how that goal would break down. So um, and uh, what I like about um, what what Joe does, and he used to do this as a financial planner, and we do this in the book, is you actually draw a little stick figure of yourself, um, or you know, if you if if you're uh, artistically inclined, you can draw yourself a little bit more more uh, um, uh, elaborately than as a stick figure, and draw a line, and so that represents your life, and so you put on that line what your goals are. So, like, let's say one of your goals is you want to retire at 55, so you put that on there. And then another goal is you want to pay for your children's um, college education. You put that on there. Um, another goal is that uh, you want to be able to, you know, pay for your mother's um, house or something like that. And you put that on there. And so by putting it on this timeline, you can see, um, for one thing, how long you have. So, you know, hey, I want to, I want to retire at 55. Hey, that's seven years from now. Hmm. All right. How much money do I have? Can I get there? What do I need to save for per month to be able to get there? What kind of return will I need to get in order for me to have enough money to feel comfortable retiring at 55? And so you're asking yourself all of these questions that are really, really helpful and that allow you to be proactive about the goal instead of, you know, saying like, that looks pretty like I used to do. Um, the other benefit of it is that you can see how these goals interact with each other. So if you're saying like, I want to be able to pay for my kids college education and you're looking at it going like, oh, retiring at 55, that's going to be like um, the second year of my my youngest child's college education. Uh, am I going to be able to afford both? And so then you can start making the uh, asking yourself the questions like, well, what's more important to me, retiring at that time or paying for um, college? So if it's retiring at that time, what can we do to um, help make sure my kid can afford college and is not going to be saddled with debt? What could we do to um, you know help? Uh, with scholarships or, you know, what level of um, loans am I willing to have my kid take on? You know, all of those sorts of questions. And so you end up talking about values um, in a way that you don't when you just say, you know, I want to retire at 55. I want to pay for my kid's college without putting it on a timeline. 
Yeah, I love that because I, I think that's where the rubber meets the road in your financial plan is what do I truly value? I can't do it all, but I can do some of it. So what's the most important stuff? And by putting it out there, uh, that's one that's one win. I think a couple other side wins, a couple side wins that are absolutely huge. One of them is 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 that you you are able to uh, engage your unconscious brain. We are visual creatures, and when we write our goals down, that's fine. But for most of us, if we can see them in relation to each other, our subconscious brain starts working on the fact of, okay, wow, I'm not just looking at that next thing, but I'm looking at all these things. And if, if by the way, if we're left to our own devices, what do we do? We say for just the next thing in line, and then we say for the next thing, and then we say for the next thing, and then we say for the next thing. Like, And I'll give you a good example. I've heard a hundred times, and I'm sure you have too, people that say, I will begin investing once I get my emergency fund done, right? I get my debt paid, I get my emergency fund done. Well, we know that when it comes to investing, beating, beating inflation is hugely important and doubling your money, getting that compounding interest is so important. So most experts will say, yeah, start your emergency fund and get that going. But once you get, you know, maybe a thousand, two thousand dollars there, it's time to start putting a little bit of money aside. And especially if you've got a match in your 401k, make sure you get that free money so that you can do all these things. But the great thing about that is then I'm saving for these long-term goals. Well, I'm not even saving for it. My money's saving for it. And I'm as lazy as the next person. Like if my money can do the heavy lifting and I don't have to, that's something that, that, that I want. So by putting them all out against each other, then we see that relation. I'll tell you, there's one more thing. And it's this, a lot of people freak out. I think freak out's the right term. A lot of people freak out about all the different investment options that are out there, right? We get FOMO. We, we, we're hearing about NFTs. We're hearing about crypto. We're hearing about all these people making tons of money. Like what's the right thing for me to do with my money? If you forget all the great opportunities and instead you begin with the goal and you work backward, you'll have this really easy equation. I need to save X amount of money and get this rate of return to equal that goal. And once I know what that return is, what that target is, then I take that whole field of investments and I'm able to narrow it down to just the few things that actually help me reach that goal. And now instead of learning a little bit about a bunch of different things that all gets jumbled up in your brain, I can go really deep on just a few types of investments that historically got me there. So beginning with that goal in mind makes investing so much easier. Yeah, that's great advice. And that brings me to a, a thought because, again, in your subtitle, you, you, the word modern money management is there. And so I think that there are a lot of recycled advice around, especially in certain communities, we have a one um, lane thought that in order to get financial freedom or financial ready, the word savings is the only thing I got. Yeah, I'm trying to save more. I'm trying to get my savings up. I'm trying to get my savings up. And I think that that's probably a little more easier to grasp for a lot of people. They feel they have more of a handle on that than to have the conversation about investing because, well, I, you know, I didn't go to school for that. You know, I don't have the money for a financial planner and, uh, you know, I'm just focused on saving. So if somebody's having that volley match in their mind about savings versus investing, it probably should be savings and investing. And how should they approach both? You talked about how it's important to have your goals timelined out and how you have them to where you can see them in relation to each other. Um, how do we proceed through the mental barriers of intimidation when it comes to investing? How do we properly allocate how much of our energy should go towards saving versus investing? so on and so forth. Well, and I can, I can jump in on this one because I saw this all the time. People would come into my office and say, investing is scary. There's so much risk. And if your goal is longer than 10 years away, if it's shorter than 10 years away, then we can talk about money in a savings account. But let's be clear right now, especially we're looking at things cost a heck of a lot more now than they did 12 months ago. And if, if your money's sitting in a savings account, it's earning maybe 0.05%. Maybe if you're lucky, you're getting half a percent, right? But we're seeing that these treasury bonds that are just based on, just based on inflation are paying seven because inflation's been seven. So if we're not beating 7%, we're actually falling behind. So whenever somebody would tell me that they don't want to invest money because it's not safe, 
I would have to turn that around on them and say, here's the deal. If we keep money in a savings account, you're going to very safely lose purchasing power. <laughs> like Very safely, you will get nowhere. And, and you have to save dollar for dollar. So think about that. If I want to, if I want to retire on the same amount of money I'm living on right now, and maybe you don't, but let's just say that you do, and you end up retired for 30 years, well, then you're going to have to live on 50% of your income while you save the other 50% for 30 years. I don't know that anybody can do that. I mean, maybe you can, and we hear the fire movement people that do that for a while, but my goal is not to live in a tent and just eat rice and beans all the time. I mean, and by the way, no stank if you like that. If that's your goal, that's fine, but I don't want that. And so uh, to save that much money is almost impossible. So I have to find, what I have to find is this. There's a, there are asset classes that are reliable when it comes to getting you there long term. It's like a taxi ride that's going down a really bumpy road. It's going to be bumpy getting there, but two asset classes have historically kicked inflation's butt over and over and over. And it's the stock market, widely the stock market, not buying individual stocks, but buying index funds, diversifying, making sure that you're safe. But the stock market historically has been over 10%. Will it continue at that? I don't know, but it's always beaten inflation, which is what we want. The other one is real estate, diversify, not one property, but diversified real estate. Uh, when you look at the North American Real Estate uh, Investment Trust Index, the NARI index versus the S&P 500, which is the stock market index, one's returned like 10.2 and the other one like 10.5 over long periods of time. So they, they get to about the same place. I like owning both. Lead with the one that makes you more comfortable. But those two asset classes are the ones that get you there reliably. I feel like even though, you know, and we can have a discussion about blockchain for a second, we don't do it even though it's modern money management much in the book, because our goal is to get you to the point that if you want to do blockchain, you want to do crypto, you want to do NFTs, that you've got, you're not doing it like a lottery ticket, like a lot of people are. You're instead doing it with a foundation. And NFTs right now I mean, if you're buying an 8-bit picture of, uh, of a tree uh, um, that maybe comes with some, some I'm going to meet a celebrity in the future, and so I'm investing in that, it feels a little to me like you're old enough to know Beanie Babies. Remember the whole Beanie Baby thing, you know, where, and, and then, you know, they're worth a ton of money, and then, then they were gone. I feel like there's some, of yeah, and, <laughs> right, right, and. And by the way, nothing against NFTs. I think the blockchain piece of that's solid, like proving ownership. It could be great for music. It could be good for property. It could be good for a lot of things. But this art craze going on right now, I think, is crazy. Yeah, agreed. And that's why I think it's important to make intelligent decisions. You were about to say something, Emily? Uh, yeah, I think one of the things that I think is really important is um, – is how we use language when we talk about money. I mean, a big reason why people find finance to be intimidating is because it has a, a different language. It has this, all these jargon. I mean, there's the alphabet soup of, of the different uh, um, words and things like that. And, uh, and so people feel like, oh my goodness, I have to learn a new language. I don't know what I'm doing. Um, and so, and I think it's partially because people are comfortable with the word saving, but we hear people talk about saving for retirement when what you're really doing is investing for retirement. Cause as, as Joe said, like, you know, you'd have to save dollar for dollar what you'd need and you can't do that. I mean, like, in, unless you're making a huge amount of money and planning on not living on much in retirement. Um, and luckily, you don't have to because you can invest, you can um, uh, partner with your money and let your money do some work for you in growing. And so if we kind of shift the conversation and start talking about it as uh, we invest for retirement, um, for one thing, that I feel it can help overcome that level of intimidation because it becomes um, a part of our regular just conversation. It's like, yeah, I'm investing for retirement. I've got a 401k um, instead of it being like, oh, investing is this thing that like the big kids do. <laughs> You know, um, and so uh, that's one of the things that I, I try really hard to make sure I don't use that terminology of saving for retirement. Because yes, you are saving money in that you're putting money that you've earned aside, but you are really doing something much more than just saving uh, when you are um, putting your money into a 401k, putting your money into the stock market, and so. Uh, changing, shifting the way that we talk about it can not only help people get a better sense of like 
what you gain by investing, but it can also like lower the temperature on that intimidation factor because it becomes something we talk about more often and becomes a you know more regular part of our conversations. You know, uh, 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 a British British people have this phrase: "God save the Queen." And if they really want to save the queen long term, you don't save the queen, you invest the queen. So it should be God invest the queen if you really want to save the queen. Just saying, British people, you got it a little wrong. Paradigm shift, guys. We're moving from saving to investing, saving to investing. Yes, you need savings, but you need to not ignore investing. And Emily just talked about a powerful word called conversation. And really, for if you're in a relationship, it's important that you have conversations about your money and come up with a plan. Um, so talk about the importance of having these conversations. And then what if you're single? How do you discuss it? Do you talk to yourself? Do you talk to a friend? Like talk about both aspects, the power of the conversation when it comes to our money and how do we handle it inside of a marriage or relationship or in our singleness? Uh, so the way that I got my husband on board with uh, financial conversations um, was, and it wasn't intentional. Um, it's, uh, I've, I'm always, I've always been a money thinker. Like I, you know, navel gaze about money <laughs> and have since I was tiny. Um, but we were on a road trip and, uh, you know, just like long, long road trip. There's not much going on. This is before podcasts. Cause we've been together for a long time. And, uh, and I said to him like, top 10 vacation destinations go. And like, we'd go back and forth, like, you know, what we each wanted to do, to to do. And his number one goal was to go to the Le Mans 24 hour, um, uh, race auto automotive race, um, in Le Mans, France. Um, which I was just like, I am down with that. <laughs> um, so he's an automotive engineer. He geeks out about the, the, um, the, the engineering, the, uh, like the specifics of the race. I want to eat French food <laughs> and go to, go to museums. This is a win-win. So, you know, this was just kind of a pie in the sky conversation in the car. But a week later, I said to him, let's start putting 75 or 100 bucks aside a month to go to France. And he's like, OK, all right. And so that was the first time that we had um, a conversation about money that wasn't heated. Um, you know, we, we generally um, agreed with each other on a lot of things financially, We're both very frugal. But, you know, what he values and what I value weren't always necessarily the same. We didn't know how to talk about it because we didn't speak the same mind, money language. And so by getting on the same page with something fun um, and saying like, OK, let's start setting money aside for this, that opened the door for us to have um, more conversations and broader conversations to um, get to the stuff that was less fun to talk about. Um, but because we started with something enjoyable, um, it uh, kind of paved the way for us to get on the same page. And so we we don't do um, a a money conversation as often as Joe and his wife do. Um, we we do it probably about once a month. Um, I have a ridiculously overcomplicated spreadsheet where I keep track of all our finances because that's I what I enjoy doing on a Saturday night. You know? <laughs> I, I know that I'm wired a little bit differently from uh, from most people, but so about once a month we go over the spreadsheet and uh, you know look at our, our expenses from the previous month, um, look at you know what we have set aside in terms of retirement, in terms of savings for um, for future like we do targeted savings for future expenses and things like that, and then we talk about. Um, um, upcoming expenses that we we might want to um, to look into, and uh, that is instead of it being the kind of thing that you think of when you think about like marital discussion about money, you, you, you think of butting heads, you think of like, I can't believe you spent this much on beer. I can't believe you spent this much on high heels, you know, that, those sorts of things. Um, but it's, uh, it, it allows us to like be very open and transparent with each other and, um, and really um, honor what we each value. Cheryl and I, Cheryl and I meet far more often as Emily alluded to. We, we, we decide to have a weekly meeting and it's, it's because of the fact that I found that these uh, organic, the deeper conversations all stem from having a conversation that you intentionally keep light and you have it often enough that 
money's kind of on the top of your mind. So you have the big conversations just as you go on a walk or you're riding the car or whatever it is. So our rules for our money meeting are this, you, you, uh, it can't be longer than 20 minutes. It's longer than 20 minutes. I don't want to do it. Cheryl doesn't want to do it. And all we do during that meeting is we, we go through uh, either your banking app or an app that you use to track your money. Most banks, you can just go through the banking app, take a look at what you spent the week before, and then have a discussion about what you're going to spend the next week. What big expenses are coming up the next week? Maybe twice a year, you look at your investments together, you add that to it. And invariably, then the bigger stuff like insurances or whatever, those arise from it. But what you find initially is how much you're spending on stuff you don't value. You're having fun talking about money together, which leads to the deeper conversations. By the way, to make sure it's fun, we always do it over pancakes or wine, depending on the time of, of day. So, um, and you know, it doesn't have to be either, or if you like pancakes and wine, you can do, do them both. Uh, if you don't, if you don't, if you don't drink that perfect pairing, yeah. If you don't drink wine or you don't eat pancakes to substitute your favorite thing, uh, no judgment there. So, but that's what, that's what we do. And it makes it fun because it becomes this little, this, this little money date. If you're single, if you're single, I think there's two ways to do it. Still have that 20 minute money date once a week where you intentionally sit down and look through your expenses the week before and plot out how you're going to spend money the next week. Almost like people do meal prep, do the same thing with your money for the next week. I also like surrounding yourself with smart people. I mean, I think it's important to have a growth mentality when you have, when you're dealing with money. I want to be, you know, often the dumbest person in the room. And I know that I'm, I'm pretty emotional about my own money stuff. So if I can find a friend where I'm not emotional about their stuff, they're not emotional about mine, and we can trust each other, I think finding somebody who's your accountability partner is a great step if you can find the right person. But if not, I think still having that time on your calendar where you sit down, this is what you do is still super important. Yeah, you all, you mentioned um, a couple you know, ways you can use technology. So I'm curious, since this is the modern money management guide um how do you all embrace technology into your processes are there certain apps that um you frequent or that you've heard or seen or research that um do well to help people do different things financially um that you would throw out there and even the mindset of using apps for these traditional money um things that we used to do without them well, I'll take this one because, one things, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, yeah. I was going to take it, Emily, because well, you're I was the queen of the say, spreadsheet. I am. But I, the thing that I, I love about, about apps these days is that um, they allow you to productively ignore your money. Like it used to be that, you know, when you had to like have, have a spreadsheet or you had to have, um, um, you know, a paper and pencil or you had to input the numbers yourself, um, if you ignored your money, your money was not going to take care of you. But now there are so many apps out there um, and I'm not an app user because I like tracking, but there's so many apps out there that make it possible for you to productively ignore your money because your app will nudge you. It'll say like, Hey, by the way, you're down to X number of dollars in your in your account. Or hey, by the way, you've spent this much on whatever you know, whatever your 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 uh, particular spending um, weaknesses. Um, or it will even you know there are apps that'll be like, hey, you've got uh, twenty five dollars um, uh, more than you need, and we're going to move it over to a uh, savings account, and that's going to help you um, meet your savings goals. So um, the the ability to productively ignore your money is just uh, I love it because <laughs> that means that even people who do not have my kind of temperament can be very successful with money because the uh, the technology can do so many of these things for them. And so, Joe, I will let you take over now with the specifics. <laughs> <laughs> well, because we, we evaluate a bunch of apps on Stacking Benjamins all the time. So I'm always trying out the new stuff and I always like diving into the new technology. But Emily hit on it, which is that, that you know, a lot of people think it's about discipline right? It's about, it's about keeping track of everything. And it's not it, as much as you can automate the easy decisions to a machine. So you can spend your time dealing with the tough decisions. Sign me up. So I, I definitely want that a few, a few of the, the popular apps out there we've tried. Um, right now, uh, I'm a fan of cube money. 
Uh, I really like Cube Money for people that need a set budget because of the fact that it is a separate bank account. So this is a good thing and a bad thing for people that are beholden to their bank. Moving your money to Cube Money seems like it's going to be tough. And I talked with Ryan, the founder of Cube, and he said, best way to start, and I tried it this way and it worked much better, just try with your groceries at first and then add stuff. So Cube Money comes with a debit card because that's the modern part, right? It's And it's also modern because of the fact that what it follows is something that was big in the 50s, which was this envelope system of budgeting that people have. So you put money in different envelopes. Cube calls them cubes. You decide how much money goes into each cube. On your way to the grocery store, you hit the button that opens up the cube. So you flip up the app, you click the button, and so that cube is, is open. The cool thing then is while you're opening that cube, There's all kinds of studies that show that you got this little circuit breaker. Do I really want to open this envelope, this cube that's full of this little bit of money? And by the way, if there's not enough money in there, you, it will not let it go through, but it won't charge you overdraft. Banks have, you know, the horrible overdraft fees. Luckily they've started lowering them lately. That's a whole different topic that drives me crazy, but the, um, but cube does not do that. So it makes sure that you can't overspend. And that you also have a circuit breaker for people that like that, but they don't want to have the same, they don't want to have a separate bank account. YNAB is another great uh, uh, product. YNAB is you need a budget. And basically what you do with YNAB at the beginning of the month, you plot out how every dollar is going to be spent. And then you spend the money using YNAB from these different kind of virtual envelopes. You keep track. YNAB helps you keep track of it. And then you, you, uh, every dollar is going to have a job ahead of time. Uh, that's a decent way for people that are super nerds like Emily and absolutely love spreadsheets. Tiller money is a neat product that takes, takes uh, all, a lot of the spreadsheeting and gives you formulas. And they've got a fantastic community of Uber nerds that, that have created all these spreadsheets and you can share them. And what's cool is while there's a lot of sharing going on, uh, it is, it has bank level security. So you're not going to run in trouble with your bank while you're doing that. And then the simple ones, of course, are just money tracking systems. And I like these, but not as much. Um, I definitely don't like mint. Um, I'll just come out against mint because of the mint has gotten to the point where when I, when, whenever I open my mint app, it t- has 50 ways for companies to market me. And I always find that I'm having trouble with the categories and it just, it seems old and big and slow. And, but if you are a mint user and you want kind of something refreshing, uh, there was an app called clarity money where they keep most of the stuff underneath the hood. Clarity Money got sold to Goldman Sachs, and now it's part of Marcus, and it's called Marcus Insights. Don't like it as much as I did before, but it's a very clean app. It's great for people that are just trying to dip their toes in. It's free, which means to some degree, they're still going to be marketing you, right? If you don't pay anything, you're the product, not the customer. So you want to watch out a little bit for that. But but I find it's it's fresh, it's refreshing, it's pretty fun to use. And I, I also um, would like to just say that one of the things that's really nice about living in the future as we do now um, with, with, with these computers in our pockets is uh, every bank these days has an app. Um, and a lot of times for people who are, are interested in, in trying an app for helping them manage their money, start with your bank's app and see what, what tools are available there. Cause there's a lot of uh, wonderful tracking notification and things like that, even before you get to third party apps. Um, and that can be really, really helpful just uh, exploring what your bank um, or, or credit union already offers as an app that um, allows you to do all of these things. And that's, that's also one of the, I mean, it's one of the benefits and, and one of the, um, um, downfalls just because it's, uh, uh, there's so many options out there. It can get a little overwhelming. So, you know, starting with your, your, your own bank's, um, uh, native app can be really, really helpful. We'll be sure to put a link to all the things that they mentioned in the show notes of this episode, as well as in the description box, if you're watching this, uh, via video. Now tell everybody a little bit more about what they will find inside y'all's great new book called Stacked and where they can pick up their copy. Uh, there are a lot of corn jokes. Because <laughs> <laughs> Joe was a farm boy. <laughs> there, there are other jokes too. There, there are, uh... <laughs> they're actually jokes. Yeah, they're not corny jokes. They're, they're jokes, jokes uh, about th- corn. They're, There's corny jokes corn. too. <laughs> 
and, and then there's jokes about us joking about jokes about corn. Yes. Uh, uh, you know, the whole thing started off. This was a project I was really excited about because of the fact that, uh, 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 I had been looking for something that was, uh, the, the Hardy boys detective manual. When I was in fourth grade, I carried the Hardy boys detective manual around with me wherever I went. And I was looking for something that adults were carry around as lovingly as I carried that around. And you could just dive into it. I mean, when my dad would go to work, my brother and I, we'd go out, and we'd, we'd examine the tire tracks because it was, it was written competently with the help of an FBI agent. And my mom would touch a doorknob and we'd go over there with tape and make sure that we got mom's fingerprint. Uh, Cause you don't know what mom's been up to, you know? Uh, uh, so th that was my first like, aha, if there could be a book out there that was like that. But then second, I was out of town when that happened. I flew home and saw the uh, that my mom had left me this, this box. I was 50 years old. My mom's finally given me the stuff out of the attic, finally. And the Cub Scout Wolf Guide was in there. And, and this is a cool thing. You know, the Cub Scouts were into gamification way before all these apps are. And I think gamifying this and making it fun is cool to the point that what we tried to do is the same thing. Start off really easy with the basics. And by the end, we're going over the tougher achievements. And every chapter is not a chapter. Like the Cub Scouts, it's an achievement. And you get to the end of the chapter and there are check boxes for you to do things to prove that you know you've got some competency because it's not about what you know, it's about what you do. And there's even a place for your mom to sign it so you can get your badge so you can go on to the next part. But if, if you're a true money nerd at the end, there's going to be deep stuff. At the beginning, it's going to be really, really light. So that's, uh, that's kind of how this came together. And hopefully you can get it everywhere, but support your local bookstore, you know, support the indie bookstores. Those are kind of going away. And if you've got a community bookstore, go, go, go get it there. Or if you're just starting your journey, maybe you won't be able to rabbit ear yours. Like I rabbit ear my Hardy Boys detective manual, but go to the library, get that, build your emergency fund, and then go buy your own copy that you can rabbit ear later. Like do it that way. So, so and let everybody know how they can keep up with you guys individually and the work that you all do on your individual platforms. So you can find me at my website, uh, emilyguyberkin.com. Um, there are links to my work, to all of my books there and um, uh, my personal blog and other work that I do. Um, you can also find me on Twitter way more often than I should be there. But I love saying hi to people on Twitter. Um, and my uh, my handle is at Emily Guy Birkin. Uh, and then I also have a Facebook author page, author Emily Guy Birkin. Um, so I would uh, love to connect and um, just uh, chat money and and uh, kind of geek out about this stuff is always, always fun. And you will find me uh, at stackingbenjamins.com and uh, every Monday, Wednesday, Friday on the Stacking Benjamins show, which, you know, I, it's been a while since we've had the McNeely's on. I was just thinking we got to get, we got to do that again. You've been on a couple times, but it has been a good, good couple of years. So we got to do that again, man. But the, uh, but you will find me and Emily and a lot of other money influencers as we go around the country on a 40 city book tour. So if you want to, if you want to come hang out with us live, uh, stackingbenjamins.com slash stacked and, uh, not just us, but in every town we go to, we're going to see if we can get the local community out together and maybe introduce you to some voices who are local as well. Yeah, we'll be sure to have every single link in the show notes and in the description box. Emily, Joe, thank you so much for coming on, sharing your wisdom. I'm sure that people have a lot uh, of takeaways that they can actionably walk out. And I'm sure a lot of people are going to go get the book stacked so that they can earn all of their badges and they can rock their finances out. So thank you all so much for coming on today. Oh, this is so fun. Thank you. Thanks a lot, man. There you have it, ladies and gentlemen, another fantastic episode of the His and Her Money Show. You have work to do. We hope that you took good notes. We hope that you're ready to take action. Everything that was mentioned, you can find in the show notes or in the description box under this video. Get it and get to work. That's all we got for this time, guys. Until next time. Peace.